In the very beginning of the time, when we actually started making robots in the industrial era, the robots, the only and only sole purpose of the robots were to make the jobs of, our, uh, of the human employees much more easier. Because they were actually made to do some of the tasks which were actually not fit for humans, or they were very hazardous for the humans. So we made robots. And they were those uh, machines which were there on the line, which were doing the work throughout the day, 24-7, and making the things much more faster and much more convenient for uh, the machining era and all that time. But now, we are moving on to a new century and we are moving on to a new generation over which we can actually go ahead and pull those robots down to our home. But it's been around 30 to 40 years since the inception of robots into the society, but we still don't see any robots in our homes. So, we actually had a dig over this event, and we actually made Manav. And as you just seen, Manav is a very, very cute robot and can do different stuff. And it is so. We, this is how Manav would look like, and Manav is completely made in India. So whether we talk about designing, programming, or anything about this robot, it was done completely in India, and it was made on a baby platform. So baby platform means that it is actually made to look like a baby whether it's uh, about the bigger head and the smaller arms and smaller legs and a bigger chest. So uh, that's, that's what the uh, basic philosophy was. And even uh, we copied the way baby thinks and the way baby learns. And that is the most, most wonderful thing about this robot. So when we started making this robot and we started programming the uh, robot to do the stuff just like human baby or just like humans, then we, we stopped over there. And we said, listen, we can't copy every single thing in a robot that we do every single day because that is just impossible. Because we do millions and billions of things every single day and we just don't notice it. Because our brain is a very wonderful organ. It does things in such a way that we just don't have a clue about it. And then I'd take a reverse back into the history, back in 2011. We, we started working on brain sensing technologies. So brain sensing technology is a very, very old technology that is actually used in medical sciences. And what the purpose of this was to basically find out how our brain is working and whether it is working fine or not. So this technology was called EEG. So through that, we can actually understand what is going on inside the brain. So for those who are not understanding what this is, our brain is made up of neurons, thousands, lacks millions and billions of neurons. And those neurons, they fire up electrical signals to other neurons which are adjacent to them. And because of that, there are different thought processes that come in our mind. And even right now, when I'm giving a talk, I'm holding this in my hand. So there are thousands of neurons which are actually firing up for me to actually go ahead and do that stuff. So what we are doing by this technology is we are sensing how those neurons are actually firing up. How many of you have got an electric shock when you were a small kid? Yeah, quite a lot. Wasn't it refreshing? Yeah? So uh, that, was, uh, that, was, uh, that basically tells you that, okay, your body is a good conductor of electricity. So when we are talking about uh, brain and uh, when we are talking about uh, the electrical impulses in our brain, so there is a very feeble amount of uh, signals that actually seep from our brain to our forehead and uh, to, to uh, the top of our uh, scalp, and we can basically go ahead and sense it. So we went ahead and we started sensing our brain for the purposes of controlling robots. So now, from brain sensing, we are moving forward to brain control. And by brain control, because when we can understand what our brain wants and what, what exactly our brain is doing at that point of time, we can understand what exactly it wants at that point of time. And at that point of time, we can completely eradicate all the type of communication medium which we are using to actually tell the robot what it actually has to do. Because if you are saying robot something that, okay, hey robot, come over here, I want a glass of water. I can say that in a certain accent, but uh, when, when I was coming back from uh, New Delhi to, uh, to uh, this place, uh, Guwahati, and from Guwahati to Shillong, so I had a SpiceJet flight, and uh, they recently had a merger with the BH Air, I don't, I'm not sure about it. So uh, the air hostess were from, uh, from, I guess, Russia or somewhere, 
So the way they spoke English was so much different from what we are used to here. And I was not able to understand any single thing which they were saying because of their accent. So when we're talking about robots, it becomes even difficult for the robots to understand what you're saying at that point of time. And if I talk about robots that can do a million tasks, then you, you're not comfortable with having a remote control with a million buttons. We are already having big, big phones in our pocket, so it won't be the most convenient thing to do. So think about controlling the robot just by our brain. Because now we can sense what exactly is going on inside your brain, and by that, we can actually tell the robot that, listen, this is what exactly I want at this point of time. And while doing that, we actually, get, uh, we actually went ahead and we made something for those people who were needy and those people who actually needed this technology. I'm talking about paralysis patients. Those patients are wheelchair-bound, sometimes even bed-bound. They can't move because they can't move their hand. They can't even control a stick, a joystick, or anything like that. And they are completely segregated from the society. And that's the most uncomfortable position to be at. So we went ahead, we took a wheelchair, and we said, listen, now we are, we are about to control this wheelchair just by our brain. We took around two years to develop this technology, and just a few months back, we actually tested this technology, and it works just fine. So I have a video with me. So I'm, uh, I'm actually on this wheelchair. Can you play this video for me? So I'm on this wheelchair. My hands are up in the air. I'm not controlling this wheelchair by any means, and I'm wearing something on my head. And because of that, I'm able to actually do whatever I want to do. So right now, also, there's a small sensor, which is at the back of my head, so that's, that's over there, which is sensing my, my impulses. And because of that, this has come over here, because it just sensed that, OK, I need a bottle of water because I'm thirsty at this point of time. And I'll just drink this water and we'll just get back. Perfect. So not only are we talking about controlling the things which are, which are around us, we are also talking about subconscious sensing. We're talking about sensing which can, which can actually do a lot of different things. Because when we're talking about brain sensing, it has quite a lot of conflict in it. How? Because when you're talking uh, through some person, when you're talking with someone over here, so what, what actually happens is that there are different parts of your brain. And in those different parts of the brain, there are different thinking which is actually going on over there. So when I'm talking about, for example, if I'm talking about uh, my TED Talk right now, or if I'm talking about you're you are, uh, actually discussing about your vacation to someone, or someone else is discussing his vacation with you, and you're like, oh, wow, that's a beautiful place. Nice, that's really good. But inside your head, in your subconscious, you're like, listen, I don't have any interest in where you went, how you went, and you're just talking rubbish to me right now. So shut up. Does it happen with you? So you're talking to someone, and you're, you're expressing something, but inside your mind, this something else which is going on, right? The third thing. Right now, I'm, I'm just talking to you, and I just did this. Where did this came from? This came from my unconscious mind. Because the actions which I'm doing right now, I'm not controlling it, it's automatically happening at this point of time. So there are three things which are going on in my mind at this point of time. There are three different things which are going on in my mind at this point of time, so which one should I choose at that point of time? Which one should I actually consider? Because if I'm talking about computers, computers are very good uh, in, in, in doing stuff, but they can't do anything physically. So if you give them a wrong command, maybe they'll hang or they'll do something which you don't want, but if you tell a robot a wrong command, then it's going to be catastrophic. So now we're talking about things which are, which are much more uh, real, which are actually happening in the physical environment. And we are talking about making things and doing things just by your brain so that it actually happens just according to you. So we segregated all those three parts of the brain, your conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. We segregated them out. And we can now choose 
which part of the brain do we need to choose, do we need to actually, uh, actually choose to actually uh, get what exactly you want the robot to do. Now moving on from this technology, we said, listen, just hold on for a second. Now we can control the robot, we can sense our brain, if we can sense our brain, what exactly is going on in our brain, what exactly is happening inside my brain at this point of time, can't we just simply copy and paste that in a computer? Can't we simply say that, okay, this is how my brain is reacting at this point of time, then wouldn't my robot do the very same thing? So back in 2012, we started this research that we can actually copy human brain into a computer or a robot. And that was one of the most toughest tasks to do at that point of time. Because when you are talking right now, I'm not concentrating on 100% of the things at this point of time. There are different things over here, and based on that, there are different, uh, there, there are different uh, concentration level, and I'm focusing on maybe only 10% of the things right now. So how does the robot know on which thing to actually concentrate on? And which thing am I, am I actually taking in context with? So we figured that problem out, and we simplified those problems, and we went ahead and made an algorithm. And back in January 2016, last month, we actually had a successful trial of brain cloning. So here is Manav, and can you play the video, please? So I'm showing Apple to Manav right now. It's seeing Apple, and I'm wearing a brain sensor on my head. This is a very, very advanced brain sensor. Now, this is basically sensing what exactly is going on uh, in my brain at this point of time. And it is sending it to that laptop which is over there. And now I'm showing that grape to, uh, to Manav, and I don't like grapes. I, I hate sour things. So I don't really like it. Now, the next thing which I do to Manav is I show him apple. Now, see what reaction does he do. He likes the apple, that's why he took his hand forward and he said, yes, I want the apple. Now, in the next case, I show him grape and see what he does after seeing the grape. So he doesn't want the grape. The so, <laughs> yes, it has. It is an Indian robot, after all. So, uh, so we actually figured out how the things are actually working. And we figured out... So uh, right now, the water experiment was just... Uh, uh, the, uh, this grape experiment was actually implemented uh, last month itself, and now we are working on how we can clone different things in our brain. And uh, the water experiment, which I just demonstrated right now, was uh, something which was uh, pre-programmed for this event. So now, moving on to the next thing is immortality. So till now, we have been able to actually copy human emotions in a robot. By human emotion, I mean that I can basically tell the robot that, okay, after seeing this thing, I'm happy or not. Am I intrigued by seeing this thing? Or am I, am I fascinated by seeing this thing? Am I showing some signs of attention, concentration? What is the level of my subconscious? All these things. And I'm putting that into the robot, and the robot understands what exactly uh, the robot is doing. Slowly and steadily, we'll be moving on to the era in which we'll be copying the ability of computation from human mind as well. Because the way we do computation is completely different from what computers are used to do. And if we are able to do that, it's going to be a completely different thing. Because computers are much, much more faster than any other human brain in the world. We have those computers with us. And if we have that intelligence, if we have that special thing in the robot, we can have a system that can actually work like a human, which can work just the way a human would react in a certain circumstance. And that's the beauty about this thing, that if we are able to copy the emotions, if we are able to copy the computational uh, ability into a robot, then we have a brain. And when we have a brain, we, we can simply imitate the whole body itself. And that's where we get to immortality. And that's where we get after brain cloning. But it's not over yet. When we talk about computers, as I just told you, that computers are much more faster, much more better than any other thing, uh, any other human brain uh, which is sitting in front of me, then maybe it can do the computation work much more faster as well. And when it does that, the rate of evolution would be much more higher. And in that case, 
the computer would be able to evolve much more faster than humans. Why? Because first barrier which we have right now is that our learning ability. If you want to learn something, you have to sit on the internet and you have to uh, open some books and then you have to learn through, uh, through reading or uh, listening or, uh, or seeing the videos. But a computer can simply take in the data in uh, the desired form and can start learning from those data and can evolve itself. But the better part about this system is that we can change the rate of evolution as well. Even in the, uh, in the algorithm which we are running on Manav, uh, about the brain sensing, we are able to control the rate of learning over there itself. Because maybe tomorrow I start liking grapes, then what, the robot, what exactly the, the robot does in that case? What exactly does the robot do when my thinking process changes? There's a conflict and it has to manage that. So we have self-learning algorithms, we have self-evolving algorithms, which can simply understand and it, it can simply know how to go in a certain direction. And the most important part about a human brain is that you have emotions. When you have emotions, you have different circumstances. For example, before this clap, you were thinking about something else. Now you're thinking about something else. A clap changed every single thing in your mind at this point of time. It's about your state of mind. When you have emotions, you have creativity. When you have creativity, you have innovation. When you have innovation, voila, we're there. Isn't it? So we are moving towards an age to where, where we can actually make robots, we can make computer systems to research new things for us. So that's where we are getting. We are getting not only to intelligence, we are going towards super intelligence. How? We take a brain of an engineer, then we take a brain of a doctor, a lawyer, and so on and so forth, and simply connect them together. We increase the rate of evolution, and we increase the rate of data acquisition from internet, from all the sources which are there attached to it, and where we reach is super intelligence, a system which is good in all the sciences, which is able to find solutions to one of the most toughest solutions in the world. It can find the solutions to cancer, to different solutions, uh, to the different, uh, different, uh, different circumstances which we are facing right now, global warming, and the world would be changed after that. And this is not something uh, of very far away. This is what we are going to see very soon. So my dear friends, things are coming, and they're coming very soon. Thank you so much.